welcome to the Our World Heritage 2021 debate. 2021 debate is a year of events focused on protection, conservation and management of world heritage. We want to uncover untold stories to broaden our views on heritage practices and future perspectives. Knowledge gathered this year will be published in 2022 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Convention. The Our World Heritage Initiative is created by individuals working on 100% voluntary capacity. We would like to point out that Our World Heritage provides an open dialogue platform that is based on voluntary work of session organizers and speakers. Our World Heritage welcomes diverse viewpoints in the spirit of collegial debate where mutual respect is afforded to all. Please note that the expressed views do not necessarily reflect the official position of Our World Heritage. We thank today's speakers for telling their stories and we thank you, the listeners, for your kind interest and questions. If you want to remain up to date on our activities, you can follow our social media. We maintain channels in multiple languages to break through the language barriers and connect to local communities. You will find all links on our website, ourworldheritage.org. Thank you for being with us today and we wish you a very fruitful event. Good morning, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I want to thank, first of all, um, to our World Heritage and the whole Place and Memory team for bringing together this event today. Um, my name is Ella Bekeshi, and I am one of the main organizers of this event, along with Dr. Uh, Jim Taylor and uh, Dawson and Jerry. And of course, the entire Our World Heritage team. Now, allow me to introduce today's session. Well, modernizing practices have little time or respect for uh, indigenous knowledge practices or ways of knowing. And this is the case, even though indigenous practices have enabled people to cope with issues such as healthy eating, uh, illness challenges, um, as well as extreme weather events for, for many, many years. Now, such practices offer decision-making options relating to village-based risk avoidance, health, or uh, producing food that enable more sustainable living and safeguard our shared heritage. And this is particularly apt when considering that humanity requires more sustainable development trajectories and to embrace complexity, while at the same time moving away from top-down um, technocratic approaches towards a more participatory governance, research and, um, and political agendas. And this, um, in short, is all about transitions as we seek to move towards sustainable living without compromising people. Now, within this milieu um, of scientific knowledge um, is still limited in securing a deeper understanding on how such change can be achieved. And this begs the question that if modern science should embrace indigenous knowledge as a legitimate form of knowledge generation, could it bring about a deeper understanding of sustainable practices and a move towards participatory governance, uh, research and political mechanisms? And so today's speakers will bring their knowledge, their insight and their opinions on this topic. And um, we hope that with this short session, we will be able to start thinking about the importance of traditional knowledge and achieving a more sustainable, sustainable world. Um, um, 
Without further ado, I would like to start and introduce our keynote speaker um, and his uh, presentation. Um, so I would like to welcome um, Rob O'Donoghue as our keynote speaker. Um, he is a professor emeritus at the Environmental Learning Research Center um, at Rhodes University. Um, and in his research in environment and sustainability education, he has given uh, close attention to indigenous knowledge practices and learning actions within a post-colonial curriculum and community contexts. And recent um, work, his recent work with critical realism has been centered on transformative social learning and expanding the scope of evaluation in um, ESD. And his most recent work on the ethics-led transformative learning has been an ESD expert net initiative and handprint care. Um, and this was undertaken within the um, ELRC T learning network with the ISSC and in collaboration with colleagues in Mexico, uh, Germany, India, Norway, Malaysia, and Japan. And this keynote presentation will, will explore indigenous knowledge practices as a foundation for uh, emancipatory learning transitions at the margins of colonial modernity. Hello, I'm Robert Donahue from the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University. And what I hope to explore is, are there alternatives to the problem-based and top-down approaches to ESD. And what I'm going to attempt to do is to clarify ESD as transformative learning actions at the margins and from below together. Um, speaking from an African perspective, one of the key things that is important is the forgotten worlds of pre-colonial agroecological heritage. And there's very little of the inclusion of heritage, despite the richness of the heritage in Africa in curriculum settings of ESD. And also there's very little mention of the trade that um, occurred in pre-colonial settings. Um, and in our Southern African setting, we're looking at the Bokoni who are represented in history and um, represented on the landscape. And they were the um, foundational historical groups that led to the um, modern indigenous cultures of today. They were absorbed into the Pedi and to the Sutu. But of course, we also have other Nguni cultures like the Zulu, the Koza, the Pondo, and the Tlubi, and the Tswana, and many others in um, Southern Africa. Now, if we wanted to begin to explore these from a, an ESD point of view, we can use a startup tool like this one, where we work with the sustainable development goals and we can begin to understand how the politics of the colonial era led to particular ways of people living together, um, marginalization and exclusion. And we can begin to then raise matters of concern that speak to, for example, health and nutrition. And with this tool, we can look at, well, um, today we have early onset diabetes, obesity, heart disease. We've got anemia, that's iron deficiency. We have got the high sugar diet producing candida in the gut. And we also have problems of marginalization, food and hunger, particularly um, with the COVID situation. So health concerns are going up and we can bring these into our ESD and very significantly, family and local food production are decreasing. So we've got very complex food security risk and health concerns that we can begin to explore with the Sustainable Development Goals. And here we can say that production and consumption has changed in colonial modernity. With the advent of cities, people moving from the countryside, with the inequalities in South Africa of the apartheid system, with the resultant poverty, hunger, health and well-being challenges, the need for education, and problems of marginalization of genders, um, where women often have to suffer quite a number of these concerns in their daily lives. Now, sufficient food quality then can become 
sufficient quality food that can then become the concern that we're looking at. But heritage practices are seldom included in subject teaching, like, for instance, the collecting of sweet water and the clarifying of water, ututu, and amanzam nandi, that relate to sustainable development goals 6, 3, and 10, and so on, geza zandla, that was seldom mentioned as um, relating to um, the COVID-19. There was a long history that was excluded there. Imifino, the wild green vegetables, and umfuno, vegetables you grow in your garden for health and nutrition. Similarly, amanzi and macheu, um, the curds and fermented grains for health, and also izala or izaleni, and the composting and growing of trees um, for carbon sequestration. And what one often finds here is that these don't appear in curriculum settings. So if we take an example like curds and fermented foods, um, and we look at heritage practices and school science, we find that the heritage practices often stand apart. Indigenous knowledge is different to the Western knowledge that you find in the subject um, curriculum. And the teacher will then bring in and teach scientific knowledge on fermentation using formula like these. Um, but we really need to bring out the intergenerational knowledge practices if we're going to be doing ESD. Knowledge related to amacheo, for instance. The use of mabele or sorghum and maize porridge that is then cooled before a ferment is added, then is stored in a warm place for fermentation to take place. Now, this sort of separation that you get between heritage practices and school science needs to be resolved through a bringing together process where plural real world knowledge practices can actually come together. And here there's some very useful tools with critical realism because both the indigenous knowledge practices and the school science are knowledge practices in a real world setting. So the real world can be the site where these practices are brought together. And what Roy Bascar offers us is um, a simple key that we can resolve, re-describe, and retrodict. We can actually backthink how things developed. And then we can eliminate ambiguities, and we can identify open explanations, and then we can correct our knowledge and thinking and change things so that we have a purpose that shifts and we have actions um, and agency that develop. Now, if we look at this in a curriculum setting, what we're able to do is to put the matter of concern in the middle and then bring together in a quadrant one or a startup story, the knowledge practices out of heritage and then bring together the scientific knowledge that we have to teach in the curriculum so that the students are able to learn something and do something um, together around these concerns. So this is a very simple model. So let's look at some examples of these, like the fermented amachewo. We can start up by tuning into curriculum and to concerns, but really the important way to start is with the knowledge practices, the heritage knowledge practices. And we often start with a startup story. And here some Sibongili describes how when she was a young girl, her mother would make amachewo, which would be carried to the fields in a calabash. The whole family would work at weeding the lands into the afternoon. When they were hot and tired, her mother would then produce a calabash of amachewo and everyone would enjoy the energy drink and get back to work. Her mother told her, that the amachewo gave the family energy to keep working and was good for digesting the evening meal. So now we've got a basis for looking at, well, did they have diabetes, obesity and candida in those days? And if we look at our supermarket today to see how things are, then we find a lot of sugars and commercially produced foods that are different in many ways to the heritage foods. And what does this mean to us today if we've got diabetes and obesity because of the change in diet? 
can we look at, in this case, what children did is they looked at Powerade, very desirable drink to have after soccer practice. And they looked at which was better, the Amachewu and or the Powerade. What were the best that um, in terms of health and in terms of energy? Was it either or or both? And what about homemade Amachewu? And the students came up with creative solutions um, to the problems of diabetes and obesity. And then um, Gina Klope, the famous poet and storyteller, she gave us this inspiration that through this kind of teaching, heritage practices, we're able to touch the past with our memories and we're able to feel the future flying on the wings of our imagination as we learn together in a classroom setting. And then one last one to look at is maybe hand washing, um, geza izantla, and tuning into the curriculum. What we found was that when COVID broke out, no one mentioned indigenous knowledge practices. No one mentioned that cholera was an earlier pandemic in Southern Africa that had a big impact there. But rural villages would always welcome visitors with hand washing before sharing food. They did this to welcome and refresh visitors in a way that the village was safe. It was a bubble from the risk of um, outside diseases like cholera. Water was precious, but everyone would wash their hands, geza izandla, before eating together. Today, people seldom wash their hands before eating, but in many African countries, hand washing facilities are provided at the entrance to restaurants. So there is a sense that how are things today in these pandemic times? We use these chemicals and um, we are able to sanitize. But we've got a long history of sanitizing through washing. And what about vaccinations today? What does this mean to us? Where, whether we get the disease or whether we get vaccinated, the body builds up a resistance. And what can we do together to keep our class safe um, and what about the um, impact of um, the vaccine on elderly people and keeping people out of hospital and keeping people healthy together? So these examples are really interesting how it's important to take the approach that um, of knowledge practices as heritage and enabling us to touch the past with our memories, to understand the problems in the present and to begin to feel the future flying on the wings of our imagination. And we can't do this with the old top-down, here's the knowledge you need. It has to be a building out of knowledge practices together and a bringing together of the best knowledge for living together safely in a changing world. So here are some references that you might find useful and some of the materials that come out of the Handprint Care Project. Thank you for that informative first opening presentation. I think it um, really showed um, an example and really demonstrated um, the idea of connecting indigenous knowledge practices with scientific knowledge and how we can implement it in, um, in schools and, and in everyday life. Um, now I want to move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter um, is Ms. Um, Felicita Cantun. Uh, Ms. Felicita is um, Maya Yucatec, living in the community of Yo Creek in Orange Walk District in Northern Belize. And in 2005, she retired from the teaching profession after serving for 40 years. And after retiring, she tutored uh, teachers all over the country. Um, and at present, she is the president of Kanan Miatil Guardians of Culture, um, which is um, an associ uh, association whose uh, main objective is to keep the Maya Yucatec alive, uh, Maya Yucatec and the Maya Yucatec culture alive. And Ms. Felicita Cantun works with children, youth, and adults. And she is the founder of Ekpalam, the Mayan ballgame um, and Mayan Poktapok team. And they are the Mundamaya champions of uh, Belize. 
And with the youth, she uh, works on traditional Yucatec and uh, pre-Hispanic uh, dances. And with children, she works on um, um, also on uh, pre-Hispanic music um, and hand embroidery. Um, and with women on learning about traditional foods and food culture. And she's a Mayan priestess and performs Maya weddings, uh, Maya baptisms, sacred fire ceremonies, um, energy cleansing, and promotes the use of traditional medicines. And um, she also owns a Pachamama, a farm where um, close to 100 species of medicinal plants are found um, in their natural habitat. And she, she loves herself and loves uh, what she does. And um, Ms. Felicita Cantun's presentation today will introduce lessons of the past, um, nature and Maya traditions at Pachamama Feliz. In Northern Belize, where most of the Maya Yucatec live, we used to rely on plants for our primary health care. This was especially true in many rural areas where plants and knowledge of their traditional use were still accessible. Due to the agricultural, the sugar cane, the livestock industries, and timber logging, our forest is disappearing at an alarming rate, and along with it, the loss of our plant species. I am Felicita Cantun, a great grandmother who loves being an elder who cultivates life and knows a bit about healing what ails us. I finally have time in my life where I can put to work some of the herbal wisdom I've gathered and wow, does this world ever need us now? Making our own medicine is ever more deeply satisfying than growing our own food. Learning which plant to grow when to harvest them and how to prepare remedies can, to care for others is incredibly satisfying. Kanan Miatsil, Guardians of Culture, is a nonprofit organization that has four acres of land baptized as Pachamama. It is a living gift that we must care for, use, and learn about and share with our children and the rest of the world. It is where we find and tend plants that are useful to us as medicine. The primary mission of Pachamama is to educate and inspire people and consume to and consumers to support best practices in terms of sustainability to maintain an ecological balance. At Pachamama, we all contribute to the sustainability of the shrubs, the trees, because we wish to have continual access to them, especially for the use of medicine during these trying times. As our world is rapidly changing, many are, we are reawakening to the ancient wisdom of plants. Having access to these natural medicines at Pachamama is a gift. And with this great gift comes responsibility. Plants, as well as every other being in nature, deserves equal rights to live. And it's our duty to protect and provide for our plants. When you visit Pachamama, you will realize that the sheer worth of the effort so lovingly put into this small piece of land has made it more than any logical value. The inner peace that one experiences within Pachamama is an eye opener to us all. It gently, but surely makes us aware that this is a place worth preserving and that we need more and more places like Pachamama, at least for the sake of our children. Thank you. Thank you for that 
inspiring presentation, Ms. Felicita. I really enjoyed um, listening to, to what you know and learn more about what you do. Uh, and I hope the participants also enjoyed um, Ms. Felicita's presentation. Now we're moving on to our next presenter duo, uh, Dr. Annabel Ford and Ms. Cynthia Elistopsi. Um, a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Annabel Ford is uh, president um, Exploring Solutions Pass, the Maya Forest Alliance, and um, director um, ISBER and director of Mesoamerican Research Center um, at University of California in Santa Barbara. And Dr. Ford um, is a Maya archaeologist, um, and that coded, and she decoded the ancient Maya landscape by combining archaeological survey with traditional knowledge and admiring the local knowledge of the Maya forest when she encountered um, El Pilar, a um, major Maya city linking Belize and Guatemala. Um, she envisioned a place of monument discovery in the context of the traditional knowledge of the people living in the region today. And she recognized the Maya forest garden as a relic of traditional land use, um, according, um, accounting for ancient Maya settlement patterns. And she brings her extensive field experience and broad um, inquisitive mind to dem demystify the Maya. And Ms. Cynthia Listopsi is a community advocate who works to promote sustainable development by building on the achievements of previous generations for future generations. And much of Ms. Listopsi's professional experience centered around placing women and families at the center of sustainable development. Uh, she began her career working in Kingston, Jamaica, where she trained in project management and development with the United States Agency for International Development and served in the office of the prime minister as an advisor on women's issues and women in development. Um, Ms. Alice Topsy went on to join the United Nations as a representative of Belize, where she worked to develop the first five-year national development plan for Belize. And in the 1990s, Ms. Elisovsi served as a deputy program manager for women, youth, and community development with the Caribbean community in Guyana. And later in 2005, she continued her work um, with uh, CARICOM as a consultant at the Regional Forum on Youth, Crime, and Violence. And she further her in, furthered her international engagement as the board director of, uh, for outreach for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean at the Western New York Peace Center in Buffalo. And from 2010 until 2019, uh, Ms. Alistopsi remained involved with the United Nations as a facilitator at the annual commission on the status of women in New York. And she has also remained involved with the El Pilar uh, Four Pillars project with uh, Dr. Annabel Ford to study cultural preservation and support conservation of the El Pilar archaeological, uh, archaeological reserve through utilizing traditional Mayan conservation methods. So um, Dr. Ford and Ms. Topsy will introduce the Living Museum of El Pilar today. Um, and their title um, and their presentation title is Archaeology Under the Canopy. So I hope you enjoy. This is the One World Heritage Indigenous Knowledge Practices as Living Heritage for Sustainability. An excellent opportunity to experience the wealth untold for humanity, not just for Belize and Central America, but for the entire world. Uh, I'm Annabelle Ford, and um, this is, uh, I'm with uh, Cynthia Topsy. And we are going to talk about El Pilar and archaeology under the canopy, an opportunity to experience the Maya forest as a garden. I am Cynthia Ellis Topsy, and I had the unique opportunity to encounter Dr. Annabel Ford, who has been working at the El Pilar archaeological site for several years, learning the essence and secrets of the rainforest, its beauty, it's love for humanity. How did we meet, Cynthia? Oh, yes, it was a very unique experience where I was in search of information for my husband, 
Harriet Topsy, who was the archaeological commissioner for the Belize. And I had heard the name Annabel Ford and went to the archaeological symposium in Belize and looking for Dr. Annabel Ford. Went straight to her, not knowing that she was Dr. <laughs> Annabel Ford. Asked her, how can I find Dr. Annabel Ford? And the rest now is history. We are two women walking on the same path. So El Pilar as the source and essence of information and secrets for humanity from the Maya rainforest. Yes, El Pilar is in the Maya forest, and that's a one world heritage that we are celebrating today. We have, we, we in view, view this one world uh, at El Pilar and archaeology under the canopy as uh, having four pillars. We have El Pilar. Yes, the wealth untold, the archaeological site of El Pilar has all the essence of secrets for humanity, for medicines, for being a canopy which covers um, sources, resources for climate change, for construction, for food, for many things. And we can get uh, a better idea of it at the Kanankash School Garden, which is a demonstration uh, place uh, begun by uh, uh, forest gardeners. And how did you experience that, Cynthia? We look at the curriculum for schools where we are able to share with schools all over the country based on the model of Santa Familia. Um, sharing, for example, some of the lessons from the 20 dominant plants of the Maya and having this as an opportunity to share not just for Belize, but for the world. And we're also doing education programs with the museum, with the Welcome Center and with outreach to schools doing the same things, inviting them, right? Yes, exactly. And in this opportunity, we share with the Museum of Belize and also the National Institute for Culture, Department for Archaeology, and many other stakeholders to be able to collaborate and to share this wealth untold all over the country of Belize and all over the world. And we can also bring in working forest gardeners like uh, Maya, uh, Garifuna, Creole, even urban. And I think you've been working with some of those projects. Definitely, that is excellent. And we are very excited for having developed a memorandum of understanding with the government of Belize under the auspices of NICH, the National Institute of Culture, so that we can um, have a succession strategy for young people and also engaging with communities, especially in this time of COVID, where we address issues of food sovereignty going beyond food security. Yeah, and that's really why we want to see uh, uh, forest gardeners uh, uh, and forest gardens, because it reduces temperature, increases biodiversity, conserves water, builds soil fertility, reduces erosion, and cares for people. So we would hope uh, you would join us uh, in this project, right? Uh, Cynthia, let's welcome everyone to come to El Pilar. Us as a gift for humanity and for the world. Thank you for that presentation. I really enjoyed listening to it. I um, had many chats with um, Dr. Annabel Ford before the, the presentation and the work they do uh, with um, Cynthia is um, absolutely amazing. And then the knowledge they have um, is also um, also also amazing. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful that we, they, could, they could share it with us today. Um, our next presenter is Mr. Uh, Mr. Julio Saki. Um, Mr. Julio Saki is an indigenous Mopan Maya, um, owner of the Che'il Mayan chocolate of Maya Center Village in Belize. And he grew up with his dad, a farmer, and one of the crops um, his father planted um, that excites him was uh, cacao fruits. And his father, he uses it for his rituals, um, ceremonies, and drinks as well. But um, Mr. Saki told him he wanted to make it into edible chocolate bars 
um, which his father got to taste before he passed away. And today, Mr. Saki finds peace and wellness in chocolate as he continues the art of chocolate making into dark and mil milk chocolate bars and other cheil um, chocolate products. And Mr. Saki has prepared a presentation titled My Life Depends on Chocolate and Chocolate Depends on Mother Earth and Mother Earth Depends on Love. So I hope you enjoy. Good evening, folks. My name is Julia Saki. And I want to talk about Cheil, my chocolate in Belize, and how do we sustain ourselves from these challenging moments that is there around us. First of all, what is most important and most crucial to our sustainability is the traditional knowledge that we possess. The Maya people, as you may know, which is who I am, are the first people to have been able to domesticate and use cacao and chocolate. Today we use chocolate not only as a treat to our friends, but also keep it as medicinal and also for our rituals and ceremonies. But we keep today our drink, our traditional drink that we give to people that visit us. In fact, the some shops around us are even starting to sell it as a drink to our visitors. But our sustainability is very dependent on how we farm cacao. Cacao, as you may know, is a tree that is a shade tree. It requires a lot of shades. And those shade trees can either be plantains, can either be banana trees, can be coconuts. And sometimes among those trees, we intercrop and we plant coffee, we plant ginger, turmeric and other crops that we can use while the cacao is off season we are able to use those to continuously sustain us and we work with our farmers we have eight farmers that we work with so we purchase their their um, ginger processing it into tea we purchase their um, vanilla which we use into our chocolate production we want to keep us going so how do we do that we have to keep our people involved and that means we have to employ all our people in the village all of them are from the village that works with us and we're happy to know that they are so happy to be a part of us we also encourage them to continue to do handicrafts so we can sell how do we sell that we, we, we bring our visitors which are mostly tourists that comes to our shop and purchase the product and not only are they purchasing their asin crop, but we also use chocolate to push our culture forward so that when the tourism comes, they also enjoy both things. They both enjoy our traditional culture, our knowledge, and also the chocolate that we make. But had we not had this chocolate production going on, these people would not have been able to come to Belize to visit us, to learn and see what we do. Not only do they buy chocolate from us, but we give them hands-on demonstrations so that they too can make their own chocolate. And I'm quite sure that you can be a part of this exciting activity. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I don't know how many of the participants are from Belize or who have tasted um, the Chail Mayan chocolate bars, um, they're amazing. So if you ever go to Belize, do visit Maya Center Village and do visit um, Chail Mayan chocolate and, and try it because they're truly wonderful. Now on to our next presenter, uh, Mr. Uh, Marvin Vasquez. Um, Mr. Marvin Vasquez is affiliated with uh, Yashche Conservation Trust in Belize. And he has a bachelor's of science in natural resource management from the University of Belize. And his work, um, his work experience with the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance in Bonaire um, honed his networking, coordination and communication skills. And his conservation work um, experience in Belize has been in uh, project management, working alongside community-based organizations to strengthen their good governance practices. As um, operations director at Yashche, Mr. Uh, Vasquez is 
committed to an integrated management approach, linking the community outreach and livelihoods, uh, protected areas management and biodiversity conservation uh, programmatic areas. As a team and community oriented individual, his management experience remains centered on strengthening the institutional capacities of organized groups. And Mr. Marvin Vasquez will now introduce livelihood enhancements in the Maya golden landscape. Good day. I am Marvin Vasquez, the operations director at Yakshe Conservation Trust. Today, I am sharing the work that Yakshe carries out with indigenous communities of the MGL. From this presentation, livelihoods enhancements in the Maya golden landscape I hope that you can follow the linkages among food security, biodiversity conservation, climate smart agricultural practices, integrated farming systems, and community outreach, all of which align to our organizational vision, harmony between nature and human development for the benefit of both. Our work is executed under four main programmatic areas as listed here. What do we mean by livelihood enhancements? At Yaxhe, this implies looking at the resources at hand, finding viable mechanisms to apply green solutions, which strengthen systems that are already in place, or replicate best practices, contributing towards diversifying income generation. At the landscape level, these systems are the farms and the sustainable farming practices that aim to address climate change impacts and desertification. Yashe also fosters forest governance and conservation management working with farmers and organized groups to build institutional and technical capacities, foster community organization and knowledge exchanges, strengthen data management and reporting mechanism. The call program has been structured to follow an FFS approach, capitalizing on knowledge exchanges among 10 buffer communities. These farmer-to-farmer -farmer interactions looks at model farms where farmers' efforts at maintaining an integrated system are recognized. Yaksha promotes ingali cropping, agroforestry, beekeeping, agroecology, and fire management. Yaksha's organizational values are to continue building resilient communities centering on traditional farming practices that have been sustaining local livelihoods and conserving forests. Finding the balance between livelihood enhancement and conservation is an investment to increase the stewardship of resources looking at subsistence farming that can be upscaled. We look at adaptive measures that will no further compromise the integrity of a natural sunning forest. These are sustainable land use and management interventions to mitigate threats such as deforestation. Promoting best practices helps to maintain the MGL productive. Indigenous farming practices for subsistence certainly contributes towards livelihood enhancements. Even when the needs are greater during the current pandemic, investing in integrated farming systems and knowledge sharing, families can ensure that their basic needs are met. Thank you for that um, insightful presentation. Um, I've been following the, the work of Yashche. Um, everyone who's from Belize probably knows about um, Yashche Conservation Trust and, and they do wonderful work. So if you haven't, um, haven't heard about them, check out their um, website and their, and their materials. They truly, do, um, they truly do amazing work. Um, thank you for, for all our presenters. Now um, we will have around 15 minutes to discuss some questions related to the topic of indigenous knowledge practices and their importance to achieve better sustainability. Um, we will now divide all the participants into three breakout rooms to have a, a nicer um, environment to discuss these questions. And uh, room one will be moderated by me. Uh, room two will be moderated by uh, Jim Taylor. And room three will be moderated by uh, Marco Vasquez, um, who is a volunteer at uh, Heritage Education Network Belize. And uh, after the breakout rooms, we will have uh, we will come together again, and we will have a chance to, um, you know, get back to the whole group and conclude what each breakout room discussed. So now, bear with me until our um, organizers. Um, 
divide everyone into breakout rooms and then you can just click join. You are muted. Huh? Apologies. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you can all unmute now and we can Good have Good afternoon. A... Good afternoon. We can have a discussion. If you want to turn on your cameras, you can. If you don't feel comfortable, that is also fine. I we... think I'm not camera ready. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> So we have around 15 minutes. We have um, around four questions we, um, we can discuss. And um, the way it will work is that I will make notes of your comments. And then once the 15 minutes are, uh, 15 minutes are up, we go back to the main, uh, the main session. And then um, I will, um, in a few words, conclude what, um, what we discussed. And then what you say will be, um, produced uh, will be made into a um, an, an outcome document that um, will then uh, be shared with our world heritage and the um, UNESCO world heritage committee um, so we can jump in if you're if you're comfortable our the first question is and this is just a free free discussion so feel free to Feel free to jump in if you have any opinions or, or, or anything you, you want to discuss. Um, so first question is, um, what was the most striking thing that you learned from um, this webinar? Anything new? Um, for me, um, I was really taken by, um, I believe it's Felicita, Felicita's uh, Felicita, presentation. Yeah. Um, she was, she, you could feel the passion of her, of her, the energy that she puts into preserving mm. the plants, um, uh, the cultural plants for medicine. Um, and she's proud to be where she's at. I mean, she said she's a grandmother, so she's, she's leaving, she's, carrying this on and teaching others and um, she's sharing her knowledge which is truly valuable i um i wanted to kind of find out or get a feel of um um what kind of medicines um is dominant is one over the other with the plants that is used for medicinal purposes is one medicine dominant over the other and how how what kind of reception is she receiving for for having this um this uh, wide range of plants for medicine is is it or is she have a, a like a crowd of following that that wants to know more about it and wants to use the medicine how can we how can i find that out um, Ms. Felicita is here, so I think she can she can um, answer your question. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Y yes, um, I can hear. Okay, at Pachamama, we as mentioned, we have almost, or I think, more than a hundred species of I plants. Oh, very admirable. Yes. Um, however. And we were discussing with the group what they think, which which plant they see is more dominant uh -huh. at, at, at Pachamama. And then we have one that we locally call Shkanan, okay. which means- How do you spell that? How, how do you spell that one? What I am giving you is the, is the Maya name. It's okay. with X, X, because in Maya, X has the sound of S-H. So okay. it's- X C A N A N. However, um, and you would find it as um, we have a, a local name, poly red. We call it poly red, and it's from the family Rubia. I can't pronounce this R U B I A, 
C E A E is from that okay. family. Mm -hmm. And that is that is that is um we find a lot of that in, in at Pachamama. And this this it is said, it is not said, it has been proved where we we as um, indigenous people, this this shrub, it's a shrub, it um we boil it uh, to treat fever. And it what is also more interesting is that the the um the leaves can be can be um I would say like um, roasted or toasted on a comal over the fire mm -hmm. and wow. ground into into powder to treat mm -hmm. wounds, um, skin problems, uh, rashes, insect bites. Um, okay. Um, I, I even have a, a doctor who mentioned to me that um, diabetes is, is abundant here in, in, in the north. And the, mm -hmm. the, um, the medicine to treat diabetes wounds is very expensive. So yes. I, was talking, I was talking to this specialist doctor about Ishkanan. And, say, and surprisingly, she said, yes, I recommended that to my patients also. It is, it is um, it, um, roasted or, or uh, on the comal, and it becomes, um, how would I say, um, you, you, can, you can grind it and make it like a fine, fine, fine powder. And then this powder is, is, um, is put on, on these wounds, they mm -hmm. work as well as the very expensive medicines that you have I'm to buy sure at the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and and apart apart from from the the plants that we that that they grow in their environment, Pachamama has also a a, a place a, a a space where we plant those that are not found in their environment, like mm. the aloe vera, the rosemary the the um, mint the fever grass we have uh, um several in a special area but then also we have those that are found in their natural habitat and it's it's oh my goodness huh it is it is just um overwhelming it is just it's a feeling that you have when you get there you you, you just feel the positive energy that the plants give you mm -hmm. whenever you're walking through them when you, you you take your forest bath you think oh my god it is it is awesome and um as i said the care the loving care that we put into these plants the respect that we have for these plants and we mayas don't just go don't don't just mm -hmm. go and break this plant no yes mm -hmm. we have to talk to the plant and, and yes I, te I tell them um my love um i am breaking or i am taking some leaves i will uh -huh. use it for for um my purpose and i ask for it so and yes. all these things mm -hmm. we teach we teach to our um to our youths because in in Kanan Miatsil, who is the owner of Pachamama, uh, we mm -hmm. have um, members from ten years up to seventies, seventy mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. and that is being taught to them. And um, regretfully, um, Pachamama is just. A reflection of the passion that we have for our for for Mother Nature. Cas Pachamama mm -hmm. means Mother Nature, Mother Earth, Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So um, it is it is um, at present we don't have any funding, but yes, we welcome um, anyone who wants to go and visit. Mm -hmm. Well, we we um, we take them, we 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 show them the plans. Um, look at this one. This is how it looks. This is the local name. This is the scientific name. This is what we use it for. Mm -hmm. And um, that's very as, nice. As it actually, uh -huh. Sorry, Miss Rosita, we have to move on to the other questions. Okay, because sure. We have, we're uh -huh. short on time. Um, it, sure. actually ties in, it actually ties in with the, with the next uh, question. Thank what you. role do you feel indigenous knowledge practices can play in our modern world? 
I think we we touched on that many times during the during the presentations. Um, one of them being, um, you know, health wise, and um, just looking into the uh, medicinal qualities of of plants and, and teaching that to our children or teaching certain practices that um, that have been that have been uh, present for you know thousands of years uh, but what do you how do you feel what role what role do you feel this this knowledge and indigenous knowledge practices can actually play in our modern world today as our world is rapidly changing um, many are, are reawakening to this ancient wisdom that we have. And, um, and yes, I find out that um, many, many, many people are coming, especially with this COVID. They, mm -hmm. They're asking, um, what can we take for the COVID um, to strengthen our immune system, to give mm -hmm. us more energy? And so it is, it is playing an important role nowadays. Yes, definitely. And um, another question that we have is, how can we support a stronger engagement in heritage work? So how can we make sure that these um, knowledge practices are taught and that these knowledge practices are shared? Um, Mr. Saki, I don't know if you have any opinions, ideas, comments. No, I think um, if you can hear me well, I, yes? um, how do we encourage this is that we, we're gonna to have to ask our um, our elders. Uh, most of them, by the way, are illiterate. They don't know how to read and write, but are packed with knowledge. We're gonna to have to ask them to be engaged into every opportunity there is to pass the knowledge on to the younger folks. And uh, secondly, we have to make sure, and by all means necessary that our political leaders, our decision makers within this, the wider society include these elders and the younger folks to continue to practice their traditional knowledge. And how do we do that? Is by encouraging them to use it freely wherever they go, and also not only use it freely, but provide the necessary resources for them that is mm. leaving forests in its natural state so that these people can continue to have it at their disposal. But if we continue to encourage deforestation, then naturally you're killing tradition right there and that's going to be the end of it. Yeah. I think, I think we have to leave the breakout room. Uh, That's what soon. I see. Yes, they, we, we're short on time, but we, we discussed, um, um, actually answered, it actually answered the, um, the fourth question as well. How can we strengthen a sense of humanity through indigenous knowledge practices? And, and I think um, it's the same way, you know, um, including elders and allow people to use these practices and allow the, have the facilities um, to, to allow and encourage to use these practices. Um, so I think I think we can click on leave room and get back to the main main um, Hi Mike. <laughs> you excuse you must, me. You're, you're, you're well done. you're not in your pajamas. <laughs> what time is it? It's uh, almost three o'clock in the three forty-seven in the morning. <laughs> wow. I just woke up overnight. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Munjari. Did you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hearing you loud and clear. Thank you, your Gahun. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That was Annabelle. That was a lovely presentation. It reminded me of the gondoliers. <laughs> yes, so we had <laughs> a call and response.
what what is our agenda here then okay so we've got um some questions to really consider um i'm not sure Jehan, if you've got them handy there to put on the screen for us no i don't have any video playing okay so hold on a sec i'll just get them but really um we'd like a discussion about how do we strengthen the heritage practices that we've heard about from um people like annabelle and others what what can we do together to um strengthen these practices in our daily lives and so on so um maybe that would be the first the first question that that we would consider. Yeah. Well, you know, I really liked that uh, presentation that opened about how he was connecting the global, uh, these silly numbers, three, six, whatever, for me, it, and looking at them, you know, they're very technical, and looking at how the education system can actually, you know, engage local practice. And I mean, this, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, well, in my case, I would always want to think of the Maya, but I mean, in my own life here, there's local practices, you know, I mean, when I was a child, we, um, we had, a, I learned a song before you go to the table, wash your hands. So, I mean, there is, uh, uh, you know, traditional practices, even in the developed world. And I think uh, turning everything into, you know, CO2 and whatever, there's probably a lot of ways we can you know, make it much more accessible, both at the school level, but taking the school to the home too. I feel like we separating it is really what's happened. I just read an article about protecting the uh, nature, but and how the Anthropocene is destroying the world. But really, we always have been here, and we've always meddled with nature. So why not make that good rather than bad? Yeah, ab absolutely, and. Um... In, in Southern Africa, where Rob and I come from, um, the, the curriculum um, almost deliberately excludes these. Um, yeah, no, but I mean, but it always does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Always, it always does. So, you know, like uh, I, I remember uh, someone telling me in, in Belize, the brook be dry. Well, I said, well, why is it dry? Well, you know, when he says, oh, when I was a kid, I, you know, would picnic and had a beautiful limb. And I said, well, what does it look like? Are there any trees there? What's upstream, you know? And he said, oh, yeah, it's all cleared for cows. Well, of course, the brook be dry. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Ab absolutely. Um, anybody else got a comment? So I've noted that that education processes should embrace heritage practices um, and especially mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, perhaps we need to perhaps we need to unpackage education and then work out what is in the school format and what is then in post school. So therefore, targeting um, um, like architects, um, targeting people in cultural studies, uh, targeting other people at university level, because they're the, going to be the people who are going to then um, uh, be crafting and being showing showing the the next stage so i think that there's different um, levels of uh, debate and i would sort of have um, a school education and then further education as two parts my third one is then awareness programs with ngos uh, what's your experience of that in southern africa yeah um often the ngos in southern africa have been forefront of trying to promote these ideas but um we often there's often a modernism um a kind of a obsession with progress modernism and development and it tends to sideline um the the heritage practices and the and the knowledge the wisdom of the past um as not being um relevant and scientific so people are encouraged to drink um, um, soft drinks that are full of sugar. And those are seen to be modern and tasty. And, and so as Rob pointed out in his keynote address, we end up with early onset diabetes, um, unhealthy children. Um, and um, 
if it's modern and it, uh, it, it, it looks like it's coming from McDonald's, then that is what is seen to be good, you well, know. And just, just very, that's very serendipitous because I'm uh, facilitating a global debate on modern heritage of Africa. And we had wow. a Shili a Shili Membo, it's been coordinated by University of Cape Town and with the uh, heritage hubs of Africa World Heritage Fund. And we've done reconceptualizing the understanding of what modern heritage is. And we're trying to bring on exactly what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. This is linking to uh, a program called Youth Heritage in Africa, which is being supported by ICROM. Um, and I think that this is another way to to i'm just saying it's particular for africa and not not necessarily but probably the what they're beginning to do is set up heritage hubs i participated in a debate in mombasa in the swahili pot i can't this was probably the most exciting um hybrid activity that i participated in the past year it was it was out of this world and it was young people, not not schools, but also, but also, but young artists and um, visual artists, um, storytellers, um, uh, um, music, um, and they and it was uh, and there's a, I think that there's they were they were they were they 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 they're hungry for for listening to um, new new ideas. Um, Michael, that's absolutely wonderful what you've just said, and um, perhaps other people in the room aren't aware that um, Swahili, or the proper term is Kiswahili, um, is an Nguni language, and the Nguni family of languages stretches all the way down East Africa, from Somalia all the way to Cape Town. And so um, I grew up speaking Isizulu, which is a sister mother tongue to Kiswahili. So when I'm in um, Kenya, I can understand what people are saying. But um, often the traditions that we were taught um, as children are lost um, in this quest for modernity or quest for what is modern and, and therefore must be good. So instead of listening to our grandmothers telling us stories, we switch on the television set and the most popular television is American soapies. In fact, um, many young um, African children that I, that I, I, I work with and teach, um, it's not football that they're obsessed with, it's soapies and they know all the main characters and it's almost like this uh, piped in culture of um, American television is, is obsessive and even in very, very poor villages, people will club together and buy one television set with a satellite dish and it, it just gets um, uh, obsessed with um, Bold and Beautiful is one very, very popular channel, for example, the Bold and the Beautiful. I can't think of, an, of anything more unhelpful, more plastic, more quick fix um, than that uh, that particular aspiration, you know. So the work you're doing, Michael, with UCT um, is just marvelous. Is there anybody who hasn't spoken who would like to pick up on this dialogue? Yes, um, my name is Judy Bob, and I work with an organization, well, my husband and I uh, are the organization called the Four World Center for Development Learning. Four Worlds, um, referring to the medicine we all use by indigenous peoples. I, I live in Canada. We've worked with indigenous peoples in Canada for um, almost 40 years. So you can tell by my gray hair. Um, so one of our areas of work was, was curriculum change. And uh, so it was not just providing curriculum that would be useful in indigenous schools, but also curriculum that would be in mainstream um, schools in terms of introducing indigenous values, stories, concepts, knowledge, and so on. 
Yeah. Um, so that's just a little bit of my background, but I particularly wanted to ask Annabelle Ford. Um, I'm a member of Rotary and we have a project in the Toledo district of Belize, uh, working with three villages there. And one of the villages, Maya villages, um, on a kind of integrated poverty reduction, community development, sustainable development project. One of the communities, Santa Cruz, has an archeological site that is virtually undeveloped. And it's one of the uh, aspirations of that small community to do something with that archeological site. And I'm just wondering about um, what they could learn from El Pilar and whether it would be really beneficial and how that could work is if a delegation from there were that able be... to come to El Pilar and really be able to see what you're doing mm -hmm. because um, just opening up to the possibilities of what can be done with an archeological site that's slightly different than say Chichen Itza or other places in Mexico and <laughs> Yet another Maya uh, temple, yeah, we exactly. don't need that. Yeah. No, we don't well, need that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's been the whole reason I want this idea of archeology span under the canopy. It is a, a lower cost, but you have to embrace what, the, what I really am imagining. I would love to, we would love to have uh, people come up. Now, I believe Santa Cruz is in, I, I, I think I know that, and there are some archeologists working in that area. So I don't know, oh. uh, uh, I mean, it's maybe- It's very little I that's happening so far. Very little that's happening. Well, I mean, so in that region, it, it, uh, yeah. but there also has been strife there. I, I don't quite know. I mean, there's been a sort of a history of, of different projects in, uh, in the south of Belize and Toledo, but I think I know where Santa Cruz is, but I, we'd welcome but a visit. Santa Helena, Santa Cruz and Pueblo Viejo are three mm -hmm. communities that are close together that we are working with. And well, I would like to uh, figure out a way we can do that. I mean, Cynthia is is on the ground sometimes. She does flit about. Uh, she has, a, uh, she's now, I mean, I don't mean flit about. She has been just spending a good deal of time visiting some uh, universities in Calif uh, California and Ohio and Massachusetts and has plans to go to Guiana shortly, but she's in the, on the ground there. So we could, uh, do, you, do you have our email? No, that's what I like to know how to. Can I put it in? <laughs> we weren't given any. Uh, we weren't given any. Uh, 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 but if you could put it in chat, that would be. Really I'll put it in the chat, and then we can talk about that later. I think it would yeah. be a great idea. I'm going to put it in yeah. right now. <laughs> Good day, everyone. Just want to give a few more seconds so people start to join the room. Okay, perfect. That seems to be everyone. Well, welcome. Um, hope you enjoyed the short presentations. We will now have about 13 minutes to just discuss some questions relating to the topic. Now I'll moderate this session and introduce the guiding questions. So please feel free to just raise your hands if you'd like to have a word. I will also take notes and we'll have a chance to get back to the whole group and conclude what we talked about at the end. So really the first question, what was the most striking thing that you learned from this webinar? And one could just raise their hand and you could unmute yourself. What was the most striking thing that you learned from this webinar? Can I'm I give it a try? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Hi, Marco. Um, I was waiting for the other participants to, to 
participate first, but as presenter, if I can give my, my answer is that presentation number three um, with uh, Mr. Saki, I like how he is able to convey his story. I drew a little bit of a content, conceptual map here. Okay. Oh, that's good. When I was um, uh, looking at this presentation and how everything connects is um, from product to Mother Earth and love, meaning that they have to show the passion to retain their traditional um, uh, drink, for example, in this case, a product that they have been used to, to, to growing up from their childhood, from their grandparents' time, um, and maintain it alive in, in, at the present day, right? So it goes, um, uh, maintaining tradition alive, but tying it into with sustainability and how you're able to have that vision of trying to maintain something as a product and bring income for your livelihoods. Then you have your farmers, your community, and you develop processes. And uh, it's just how uh, that story is knitted together and be able to convey that story uh, in this event is what strikes me because Belize has really good stories to tell. And uh, we are here to share those stories so that you know it, it garners more attention and recognition. Okay, perfect. Anybody else has um, something to share? Okay, I guess we could move on to the other question. What role do you feel indigenous knowledge practices can play in our modern world? You can just raise your hand on the um, the reactions on Zoom. Just raise your hand and I could ask you to unmute. Oh, okay, you can go ahead. Session Studios. Shoshin Studios, can you can you share your thoughts? You have your hand raised. Okay, okay, I guess we could move on to the other question. How can we support a stronger engagement in heritage work? How can we support a stronger engagement in heritage work. Okay, go ahead, Marvin. All right, well, let, let me talk again. Um, if anybody feels um, you want to add more, feel free as well. Um, I think support comes along with the like-minded like individuals. Uh, there's a reason why all of us are here today is for information sharing mm -hmm. and see um, what it is that uh, our mission or visions or our personal values align to the information that is being shared today. And it's important um, to continue the networking. Um, uh, a lot of times um, we see like those who are working in, in the um, OWN um, in the network or in the conservation um, arena or in other public or, or state kind of work that's only related to you, you don't get to know much of what is happening around you. So networking is important and ensuring that you give that dialogue space um, for, for example, Yakshe presenting today and the other presenters um, with El Pilar 
uh, with the Yucatec Maya in Orange Oak and uh, the chocolate of uh, Maya Center. We need to continue um, fostering that knowledge sharing um, uh, mechanism and uh, do a little bit more of coaxing um, participants to, to also be able to share uh, um, what they're thinking and so encouraging people to participate as well and do a, a lot of um, a lot more of awareness raising keep blasting social media uh, with this kind of information uh, encourage people to share like because what that is important right now everybody is sticking on their phone uh, tablets computer so it's it's a way of targeting your audience and sharing that kind of information so uh, from my um, perspective it's uh, more networking and the use of, of social media platforms. Okay, networking and social media, just basically sharing knowledge um, from different industries within the, the scope of, of, um, of the indigenous and heritage work then. Uh, yes, Kim? Yes, thank, uh, thank okay. you very much for the great presentation of Marvin and the great opportunity to share uh, our comments and questions here. I believe that uh, in terms of uh, in indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge of the local community, I believe the sort of democratic process to reflect their uh, ideas uh, and thoughts to the heritage management policy. This is very significant process uh, uh, for uh, preserving the indigenous culture and heritage values. So I would like to uh, ask uh, to share your experience or thoughts uh, about the democratic process, how we approach, uh, how to approach the indigenous knowledge to uh, decide the heritage of value. Can you elaborate on what you mean by thoughts on the democratic process? I know. For example, the heritage value can be easily evaluated by the top down approaches uh, by uh, a limited uh, number of uh, heritage experts, but the mm -hmm. Uh, the bottom-up approach uh, will be the more important for heritage management and preservation uh, in order to uh, utilize the indigenous and traditional knowledge. So uh, Marvin, could you share your thoughts or experience uh, uh, about your work for the indigenous culture and heritage? Yes, sure. Um, at Yaxie, we work with um, offering communities, those communities that are adjacent to protected areas. And uh, our work has a lot to do with consultation, um, um, community outreach and sharing information. And a lot of times um, we, we have a community liaisons officer, a manager that goes out into the communities and, uh, and sharing information and talking and, and in inviting them to our work uh, under our program. So uh, it's, it's a, a choice that uh, it's play or an opportunity that is made available um, to the communities if they want to integrate into the work of Yakche. And it's open to both um, women and men and also the youth. Um, so a lot of times, um, uh, the sharing of information can also happen or the invitation to participate and uh, bring in their knowledge. Uh, like for example, the traditional farming practices is um, uh, combining uh, what is already being done uh, and integrating it into our um, program, which is uh, climate smart uh, farming practices. So one of the things is that uh, we, aim to understand um, what the communities have to contribute. And if it's a practice that aligns well with food security, climate change and life on land, if we um, take it up to the sustainable um, development goals and uh, try to see if they understand that certain practice may or may not have 
a negative impact when we focus it on the conservation side of our work. So we try to find that balance between um, conservation and the use of the land and the forest and see if uh, the practices that they have contribute to the livelihood enhancement, seeing that, okay, um, I have this piece of land um, uh, is burning, for example, uh, a good or a bad way to use the land if we want to conserve the forest. But conserving the forest means that they have to live. So um, we give them the option um, to choose um, from different farming practices that align with their style and their tradition so that we ensure that uh, there is a continuous uh, productivity of the land and uh, do away with um, use of uh, uh, inorganic pesticides, you know, or chemicals. And uh, uh, it al always has to do with the, 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 the consultation and that dialogue, that one-to-one -one dialogue, and then bringing back uh, using a, a, a model farm where uh, if we are having good results, then we have those peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and say, okay, you know what? Um, Mr. Vasquez um, from uh, this community is having good results with their demo plots. Uh, do you want to see what they're doing? Uh, let's do a field trip um, and see what's happening. I mean, it was easy um, when COVID was not hitting us, but now we have to be careful with COVID and who and where we're going to and how we are taking them, uh, mobilizing the communities. Um, but now we are trying to integrate now this digital um, platform and, and sharing that information through a cell phone and see how much um, we reach to, to, to our youth. Oh, it's very interesting. Personally, as, as a Belizean, I, I've heard of Yaksha before, but I didn't know really it was that um, intensive and your role in basically conservation. Very nice. So we do have only about 30 seconds left. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining. Thanks for participating. And uh, we'll get back to uh, the main room with everyone else in just about 20 seconds. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you've had great discussions. I know the time was short, but, but hopefully we, um, hopefully you managed to make some connections and, and talk about some interesting things and share your opinions. Um, now I just want to ask um, our breakout room session moderators to, um, including myself, <laughs> to, um, to conclude some of, the, some of the things that were mentioned during the breakout room sessions. Um, and then we will move on to, to closing remarks. So I think I will start first because um, I was breakout room uh, number one. Um, so we, we talked about, um, we actually talked a lot about um, Miss uh, Felicita's um, work at uh, Pachamama and um, she, she told us a bit more about uh, her um, her garden and uh, the plants that she uses and um, how she um, processes plants and one very interesting um, input was that um, she talked about uh, the respect that we have to feel for um, the plants and instead of taking the leaves we have to ask um, the plants um, and we have to respect the plants and we have to um, ask them to, to give us um, their leaves um, and, and their fruits for use. And that was a very interesting and um, very interesting and eye-opening approach, um, I think, for some of the participants. And then um, we also touched on um, one of the other main uh, things that we touched on was uh, how can we support a stronger engagement in heritage work? And um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Julio Saki shared that um, we have to ask our elders to share their knowledge and ask them to, to be um, engaged and pass on their knowledge. But what is more important is that we also have to make sure that the decision makers um, in a country actively include these elders. And by that, we mean not just allow them to use these practices freely, but also providing and actively providing uh, the facilities and the environment to practice um, practice this knowledge um, and to have these practices, to maintain these practices. And that includes um, maintaining the environment and maintaining the forest and maintaining um, nature 
um, so that there is space to practice these um, these traditions that are strongly connected with the environment. And I think that's that's a very um, short conclusion of uh, what we what we discussed. And now I think if we could move on to Jim, who was the Jim Taylor, who was the second group moderator, um, to conclude some of the the outcome. Well, th thank you very much, Ella, and. Uh... Well, a huge thank you to all the speakers that went before us and before that breakout room. Um, what inspirational thoughts you all shared with us. So thank you so much. Um, we, could have, we could have had an hour session and still not covered what was needed to be said. And what a privilege to be in the same room as Judy Bopp, um, Michael Turner, Annabelle Ford, and many others. Um, and just to share their, their insights around these topics. Um, the importance of education, embracing heritage practices was emphasized. Um, and the, uh, Michael urged us to unpackage education and look beneath the skin of what's really going on and try and look for depth. Um, and maybe that could be facilitated by NGOs um, as is being done in the work in Canada that Judy was able to describe. Um, Michael also mentioned the uh, Kiswahili work um, of Eastern Africa and how inspirational it was to him to come across those practices. So often it's important to challenge the status quo where a sort of modernistic um, trend is taking root and um, Many of us, and particularly indigenous people, are beguiled by what appears to be modern. Um, I refer to how uh, American television culture is interpenetrating Africa and displacing the art of storytelling. So in rural villages, even very poor rural villages, people club together, purchase a television, and instead of having um, heritage stories from the elderly, uh, about the richness of humanity, they get um, saturated with um, soap operas from uh, often from from Hollywood, and they're very superficial and they're very much around um, good-looking people living plastic lives. Um, curriculum that mainstreams and indigenous knowledge practices was emphasised in the in the breakout room as well as learning from archeology span uh, was another insight. Uh, what can we learn from the histories of the past? And an interesting links between Mayan culture and African indigenous cultures as well. I could never even do justice to our short little breakout from session. Suffice to say, what a privilege to be with those of you who are able to join us for those brief 15 minutes. Um, Thank you for sharing your wisdom, depth, and insights. Um, yeah, back to you, Ella. Thank you, Jim, for sharing the conclusions. Um, I agree, 15 minutes is very short, but hopefully we, we sparked some conversation and, and uh, people made connections and we'll continue the conversation after, um, after this session. And um, lastly, I just want to invite uh, Marco Vasquez to conclude the third breakout room session. Thank you, Ella. Um, well, coming from a non-cultural, um, in quotes, non-cultural background and, and field of study, um, this was all very impactful, to be honest. Um, we were all impressed by presentation three, which is Julio Saki, and how he maintains tradition alive while being sustainable. And over the years, from from um, from his father up to up to now, how he has really improved and added several features to his organization. Another thing that we focused on was um, the importance of sharing knowledge, networking. How, how important networking, networking is and how opportunities like these to share knowledge does help support um, heritage work. It also encourages, uh, we want to just encourage people to participate and just 
reflecting on ideas and thoughts as well. And we learned uh, a bit about uh, Mr. Marvin Vasquez's um, presentation and his, um, well, and Yaksha as well, and really what they do and how important they are in, to, in Belize when it comes to conservation. And back to you, Ella. <laughs> Thank you. Um, definitely. I, I see that there were so many interesting um, interesting ideas and interesting, interesting topics. All three uh, breakout rooms had very different um, approaches and very different ideas, which is, is great to, which is great to hear. And we will compile all of these ideas into uh, one outcome document. Um, and now, um, sadly, we got to the end of this session today. And so I would just like to um, invite um, and give um, give the narration back to um, the Our World Heritage team and um, we can listen to closing remarks. Thanks, Ella. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Hi, everyone. My name is Jae-hon Choi. I'm the convener of the memory team. Uh, professor of the University, Gongguk University in Seoul. It is my honor to speak this closing remark on behalf of the memory team. I'd like to express my gratitude to all who are here and sharing their wisdom about the indigenous knowledge practices. The value of the tangible heritage would be enriched by the adding intangible dimension of heritage. Uh, like the indigenous wisdom inherited down generation to generation. As you know, the heritage place and the memory is a part of the ninth month of the Our World Heritage Debate. The background idea of OWH initiative is that 1972 World Heritage Convention in the framework of outstanding universal value discourse is not enough to pay attention to people with the intangible dimension of its memory and local values. Therefore, the OWH initiative supports civil society's proactive role in implementing the World Heritage Convention and its spirit. We may need a more inclusive and multiple approach based on the multiple memories of diverse stakeholders and the indigenous knowledge practices, which may enhance human rights and the active role of civil society toward a more sustainable and then more appropriate World Heritage management. I'd like to say thanks again to Ella, G, and the Munjeri, actually, Munjeri, Dr. Munjeri will be, would be here for their passion and their support to organize this wonderful, successful session. Also, my sincere gratitude should go to all panelists and participants for being with us and sharing with us today. Thanks again. And uh, Tomorrow, we're going to have a wrapping up session. So nine, uh, nine o'clock UPT time. So I hope to see you there. Thanks a lot. The floor is yours now. Thank you for the closing remarks. I think um, sadly, all that's left to do is say goodbye uh, for, uh, for today. Um, again, I hope that You've made some connections and I hope that you will continue the conversation and um, this um, recording will be available on um, the Our World Heritage um, social media channels and I will make sure to uh, send a link and send a copy to, um, to all the interested participants. So thank you. I hope you had a nice time and hopefully see you. Um, in some other events and in, in future events in the coming months. So thank you and goodbye. Bye. Thank bye. you for the opportunity. Bye. bye.